Pros and cons. When I started this Hall of Fame, I didn't need these glasses. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to reveal to others what I have known for many, many years about Julie Smith. Julie is one of those people who go about their day-to-day -day lives with extreme focus and purpose, just wanting to make a difference. And tonight, we honor that difference. Julie Smith is an amazing woman, but it's not only because of her entrepreneurial spirit and her incredible business acumen. All of those things are very well documented, and you can read about those in her biography. I want to tell you more about who Julie really is as a person, a mentor, and a friend. I've known Julie for about 30 years. She's been steadfast and by anyone's measure successful in her quest to apply her life's work to helping others. She has been unwavering in her loyalty and commitment to West Virginia University, to this state, and to the field of behavioral psychology. Julie's businesses are founded on the concepts that she learned as a student at WVU, and she is very proud of that affiliation. In fact, in all of her work abroad and in the United States, she is clear and consistent in bringing positive accolades to our university, to our state, by identifying herself as a graduate of West Virginia University and a resident of West Virginia. Tonight we're going to talk about ex her exceptional entrepreneurial career with a lasting legacy of work. The words transformative, visionary, and thought leader are often used to describe Julie and her work. She has pioneered programs and processes that are in use in client organizations literally all over the world, as well as in the homes of individuals experiencing great life change in their lives. When I was gathering support for this nomination, 22 people joined me in that effort. Many wrote their own personal letters. Many of them are here tonight, and I hope that I represent you well. Julie came to West Virginia University from her home state of Minnesota to pursue her master's in psychology and her doctorate in behavioral science, and she never left. She found in West Virginia University an academic climate that both challenged her and fulfilled her, and in West Virginia, a business climate that was ready for her talent. She began her career in the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies and Development in our own College of Engineering. In fact, that's when I met Julie. We were very young in our careers. Well, we were just really very young, <laughs> period. We were wide-eyed and eager to make a difference. Our meeting was happenstance, but the friendship has endured. I've never met anyone with such passion for her life's work and for life itself. Her first entrepreneurial venture when she left CESD was to establish the Continuous Learning Group. That was in 1993. It began with six employees in one room in a very small business incubator near the Morgantown Airport. And it has grown into the largest behaviorally based management consulting firm in the world emphasis on in the world. It was and still is very innovative in terms of its business model and it currently employs over 140 consultants located in six continents with headquarters in Pittsburgh and client services and production offices in Morgantown. They have field offices in San Francisco, London, Singapore, and they cater mostly to Fortune 500, I'm sorry, Fortune 100 clients. Using principles from the field of applied business science, Julie's innovative approach proved to be highly successful. This process resulted in a significant competitive advantage for Bayer Corporation. In fact, thanks to her work, Bayer's process was recognized by other organizations, including the United Nations, as a global best practice for driving sustainable change across large, highly complex organizations. 
Julie was the first to work with a European-based CEO on a revolutionary reorganization implemented throughout Europe that transformed how the company worked and its suppliers and customers as well, and how the firm was led. That CEO went on to become CEO of one of the largest European headquartered pharmaceutical companies. And the first thing that he did after saying yes and accepting the job was to call Julie to secure her personal commitment to continue working with him to help ensure his success. He's brilliant, isn't he? <laughs> this pattern has defined Julie's career. Her effect on leaders is transformative, and those who work with her are never the same. She was CLG's first managing partner, providing not only the vision for the firm, but its day-to-day -day leadership and now she serves as CLG's senior partner and board member. Not one to simply sit back and enjoy the early success, she understood that the work that she was doing had real meaning, not only for organizations, but also for individuals impacted by significant change in their personal lives. So in 2002, she founded a second consulting firm, LifePath, and then a third named Change Matters in 2009 to provide personal change tools that help individuals successfully manage change in their personal lives. During the development of these products and services, she would occasionally call and ask, how would a patient in your hospital react to hearing this diagnosis? Or how can this piece be written in a way that speaks directly to the family of someone who has just received a life-changing diagnosis? It matters to Julie. Every word, every tool, Every bit of it matters to her. And it's why she's so successful in business, and it's why she's so successful in life. As a way of paying it forward, she's dedicated to supporting graduate and postgraduate students of WVU, and has shaped and influenced the lives of many psychology and business school graduates. And she uses our great university as a feeder system for talent at CLG. Through her generosity, she's known as the go-to person for WVU graduate students who aspire to careers in organizational behavioral consulting. She has created businesses that have succeeded on the national and international stage, as well as developed businesses and programs ded dedicated to West Virginia. Anyone who has driven along the mile ground near the end of 705 has seen just how crazy intuitive this woman is. Who else would buy an old truck, paint it wild colors, and then stick a 10-foot chicken on top of it to advertise her new winery? <laughs> Julie Smith. This new winery distillery is her most recent success that she and her husband Mickey opened to serve this region as a special event venue. I remember once having a conversation with Julie about my best friend Barb and how long we had known each other our entire lives. And Julie said, oh, you are so lucky. I have a Barb in my life, too. But her name is Rox. You have to meet her. Well, here's the story that Rox shared with me about how she and Julie met. And honestly, I, I think it's worth telling because I think it tells you everything that you need to know about Julie Smith. And these are Rox's words. Julie and I have been best friends since we met as 10-year-olds in the fourth grade. It's an interesting story and reveals much about Julie's character even when she was a child. I was new to the school and we had just met and I'd had a bad day in my new school and had decided that I was leaving and not coming back. Even at her young age, Julie's curiosity, her need to understand how people think and her desire to uncover the real story led her not only to find out who the new girl was but to locate where I lived and arranged to be outside my doorstep extra early the next morning so she could walk me to school. Today I realized that Julie just had to know if this was a unique situation or something that I had done at, private, at previous schools, and she wanted to know how that had worked with my parents and teachers and my peers. I'm sure she provided guidance to help me work through the challenges of successfully navigating through grade school and the challenges I faced as the new girl. So I thank, I thank Rox for those words. Julie Smith is one of a kind. 
She is known globally as an innovative practitioner and author. She is widely recognized internationally as one of the greatest thought leaders in the organizational behavioral management field. And she is the expert that practitioners seek out for help in defining and shaping that discipline's future. She's the real deal, folks. But Julie's contributions go well behind, beyond a single project. She's been a paragon of achievement and integrity whose example has inspired many who have come in contact with her. Her friendliness and warmth, her patience and ease in giving useful advice are attributes that many of us can only hope to emulate. Her translations of the lessons of behavioral science into practical application are to be admired by all who pursue higher learning. Her ability to accurately perceive the needs of individuals evokes a natural trust, marking her as a true leader who aspires, inspires confidence. In essence, her style of leadership is one that is well suited to a future in which empowerment and engagement are the bywords. So if it sounds like a fan, you're right, I am. In fact, there aren't many people who I admire or whose business instincts that I trust more than Julie's. In fact, she's the first person that I call if I'm headed into uncharted territory. Her read on a situation is always spot on. And I should tell you that she takes or returns that call every single time, regardless of where she finds herself in the world. She's a friend, a mentor, and to those lucky enough to work closely with her, an incredible teacher. She inspires those around her to reach higher and achieve more. And I can't wait to see what's in store for her second act. I can think of no better role model for the young women of this university who are in search of inspiration. And finally, no one has had more impact on me in a, as a role model than Julie Smith. And I can think of no greater way to honor her accomplishments than to introduce her as a 2012 inductee of the West Virginia, West Virginia Business Hall of Fame. Thank you. <laughs> takes my uh, breath away. Thank you so much. I mean, it just means the world to me because I know there are a number of people who pulled this together. And I've had other friends who've gotten honors, and I've always said, how did that happen? It always seemed to happen like magic, and that's, that's what you made happen. So I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, what an honor to be up here with these two gentlemen. It's just incredible when you think about it and the talent that's in the state. Um, I have one thing to tell you, though, that was not quite correct on your whole you know, rundown of the history is my girlfriend Roxanne is in big trouble. You, you guys know Roxanne, right? She comes here and she helps us with the winery and things like that. And she's just a dynamo. And really, when I met her, was in fourth grade. And the reason I met her was not just because she was new to the classroom. I hadn't really noticed her up until the day that she turned to the nun and actually swore at the nun. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to get to know her. <laughs> She has guts, and this could break me out of here. <laughs> and I was spot on because Rox wound up uh, being one of the founders of GameStop. I don't know if you have kids who use all the video games, but she's a real powerhouse, and I learned a lot. My gut was right. Get to her house, find out what's going on, how she's being raised, and, and uh, find out if there's things I could take. One of, one, of the, one of the things I thought about, you know, um, I worked for 13 years at the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies and Development. And I studied entrepreneurs. I was not an entrepreneur. So I got to see a lot of the things that went well and a lot of the things that, that didn't. And because of some of the success that we had at CESD, and Jack Bird was just a wonderful boss, uh, we started doing a lot of things with for-profit companies, which threatened our not-for-profit status. So you'd think I was a natural sort of entrepreneur. I wasn't. I was kicked out of the nest. Because we couldn't keep competing at the national level where we were competing without becoming a for-profit company. And I remember at the time I lost some of my hair, even. It was so stressful. And I think that there was a point, you know, that I realized, gosh, you just have to begin to learn to live with that stress as an entrepreneur. And that's like a turning point. That's almost a freeing point where you can, you can let that go 
and work with the people who are there who are so good and not have to control everything and uh, you know really get an esprit de corps and that took me about five years to learn that and that was a up and down sort of uh, lesson as an entrepreneur but once I learned it it set me free to be able to do all sorts of other things I initially uh, there's two people in the room they say you know entrepreneurs are kind of born that way they're not <laughs> entrepreneurs are made and they're made by the people who are around them they help shape them they help form them they help them and um, I want to tell you about the two people who I wish could be here today but who aren't who made me and those are my parents and I don't mean it in the way that you think they made me as an entrepreneur <laughs> My dad himself was an entrepreneur, and I think one of the critical things that happened to me that was a blessing is we would sit around the table at night and talk about his business. And so I knew how many patients had come through that day. I knew you know, what was going on. I knew when he had new office staff. Um, I even remember vividly one six-month period where he didn't work at all, and he was a sole source of income for his business uh, because he was a chiropractor. The reason I remember it vividly is he didn't work because he had a bad back, and that's not good if you're a chiropractor. <laughs> Unless you say, well, I couldn't work on myself, right? <laughs> so, I, and, um, I, you know, I watched him, I learned from him, and I even tried things at a young age. A lot of people in CLG know that one of my first jobs was to sell water. We lived along um, a golf course. I grew up in a very small hometown of about 10,000 people, and we lived along the 17th green of the, the golf course, and I thought, you know, on Tuesdays, Ladies' Day, they get a little bit happy and giddy when they're, by the time they get to the 17th green. I didn't realize what they were doing at the first uh, 16 holes. And I thought, they seem very thirsty, and they've got that one last, you know, um, place, one last hole to go till they get up to the clubhouse. So I actually thought, I'll sell them water. So I actually sold them water, 10 cents a swig, everything that they could uh, drink out of the hose. <laughs> My dad came back and he said, Julie, I'm hearing about what you're doing in the office. And I said, but dad, it's really working well. They love it. I'm making all sorts of friends. And um, he said, well, I really think you should offer glasses. And I said, that'll cut into my profitability. <laughs> <laughs> so my parents really helped me. And one of the things my mom did is she said, we had five kids in my family. And um, she was just a wonderful, strong, dynamic, fun woman who had lots of friends, very intelligent, curious, and she would tell each of us what she kind of saw for us in our lives. And she said, Julie, I see, she kind of painted a vision for me. She said, I see that one of your biggest challenges in life is going to be to figure out how to pay back your God-given talents. And she said to a lot of people. So when you said that, Maria, I think that you know the ability to impact a lot of people is something that was created for me very, very young by a woman that I adored. And so it was always trying to figure out, literally, until I was almost 35, how to do that. So I studied entrepreneurs, I studied all these different areas, and I really didn't start CLG until I was 35. And then I was just blessed to be with all the people who are here today from CLG. And they help figure that out in terms of how we can take what we do to very large groups of people. And some of the projects that we've done globally just, you know, they almost bring tears to my eyes. We've kept, um, in South Africa, there's a refinery that a major oil company was going to shut down. And we came in and we helped them. They were going to shut it down because of safety issues, environmental releases, and things like that. And we helped them uh, overcome diversity, caste system sorts of things where they just wouldn't talk to each other about production. We helped them get everything back up and running and move from the bottom quartile in the world in terms of refineries up to the first quartile. We did that through things we pulled together and learned and created and um, you know, that emanated from WVU and a couple of other really core universities. Every person who worked in that refinery supported 40 other people. Okay? If people lost their jobs, they wouldn't tell their families. They were too embarrassed to tell them. So the type of impact that we've had at CLG, I think, has just been phenomenal. And um, you know, I think through the years, if you think about um, entrepreneurs needing guts of steel and soft hearts, the CLG folks have helped me learn how to balance both of those. Those things don't come naturally, and it is a, it is a balance. So I appreciate every single one of you who are here. I also have some girlfriends who've been instrumental in my life. And I've got a group of women who I met with every Sunday evening who would listen to me go, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, I, <laughs> what are we? And um, they would say, don't worry, you don't have to control everything, let go, it'll be okay. 
And uh, you kept me going through many, many years, and we've got several people here who know exactly what I'm talking about. And then we've got the women who helped take what we're doing to apply it to women's health in West Virginia, and that's been a blast. And you guys have uh, just been a godsend to me in terms of helping to do that, and you pushed me out of my own comfort zone as we've all looked at our own health issues and where we stand you know, relative to everybody in the country. So it's just been quite a ride. I just can't even imagine where I'd be without WVU. My poor mom, I told her that I'd be back after four years. I don't know what I was thinking, thinking that a doctorate would take four years. I mean, that was crazy alone, right? And then, <laughs> so after seven years of getting my doctorate, um, it was pretty clear to my mom that I wasn't coming back because I love this state. I love the people in the state. I love the heart of the people. And then ultimately, I fell in love with the, the man who became my husband. And Mickey, um, you are, I'm blessed every day that you came into my life almost at the same time that I started CLG because it really takes a strong family to center you. And um, he's the only person that's stronger than I am, I think. <laughs> and Mickey, you've just been a godsend to me and it's been a blessing that we've been able to now cycle back around and start a family business. So um, to come back and have the winery and have our grandkids there at night is just, what a delight, you know, I can picture my retirement. So every single person in this room who's got a smile and kind of has been through this journey with me, I can't tell you how grateful I am for you. And then two little kind little kids have been so quiet back there, it's so good. So Octavia and Seb are two of my grandkids and we're gonna teach them to be the next generation at the winery. So thanks you guys. Okay, I just want them to get used to, uh, you know, saying hi to large crowds. <laughs> So it's just such an honor, and um, I feel really blessed to be here in West Virginia and to know all the great people in this room. Thank you.